Jose, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering Hadoop Summit 2016. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Here's your host, John Furrier. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for theCUBE. This is our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from those. Of course, we're here at the Big Data event, Hadoop Summit 2016. We have a special guest, celebrity now author of the best-selling book, Magic and Loss Virginia, Heffernan, Magic and Loss, rising on the bestseller list. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank and you, our John. Show. You are my internet friend, <laughs> and now you're my real life friend. You're my favorite Facebook friend that I just now met for the first time. Exactly. Great to meet you. We had never met, and now we, but we know each other of course, intimately through the interwebs. So I've been following your writing, New York Times, and you were doing some stuff on Medium, and then you, you kind of advertise you're doing this book. I saw you do the Google Glasses experiment in, I think it was Brooklyn. It I might was <laughs> so into Google Glass, and I will admit it, I fall for everything. I fell for VR and all its incarnations, and um, and the Google Glass, you know, it was like that thing that was supposed to put the internet, all voice activated, just put the internet always in front of your face. So I started to wear it around in Brooklyn, my prototype. I thought everyone would stop me and say how cool it was. In fact, they didn't think it was cool at all. <laughs> New Yorkers, they'll tell you how they yeah. really feel. Yeah, yeah, you got yeah. a problem with that? Um, your book, Magic and Loss, is fantastic. And I think it really is good because uh, Dan Lyons wrote Disrupted, Love which book, yeah. was fantastic. Dan Lyons, big fan of him uh, and his work. But it really, it wasn't a parody. He also writes for Silicon Valley, the show that's kind of taken that culture and made it mainstream. I have people calling yeah. me up and say, hey, you live in Palo Alto, oh my God. Do you live near the house? I'm like, it's on Newell, which is one of my cross streets. But, <laughs> but the point is, tech culture yeah. now is kind of in a native, my youngest is 13, and you know, we're an iPad generation for the youth, and yeah. we're from the generation where there was no cell phones, and like, I remember when pages were the big innovation, and That's internet. Right. But I think I, know, I think when I'm telling you, I, I think I know I'm talking to a fellow traveler when I say that there was digital culture before the advent of the World Wide Web in the early 90s. You know, I, I'm sure you did too. Got electronic games like crazy. I would get yeah. any Merlin or Simon or whatever that they, they introduced. And then I also dialed into a mainframe yeah. in the late 70s and the early early 80s to play the computer as we called it. We didn't even call it the internet. And the thing about the culture too was email was very, you know, monochrome screens. Yeah. But again, clunky, but still connected, right? So we were that yeah. generation of, you know, putting that first training wheels on and now it's supposed to be, so in the book, your premise is um, there's magical things happening in the internet yes. and art countering the whole trolling, uh, yeah. you know, the internet's bad. And well, you know, recently someone asked me, how can the internet be art when Twitter is so angry? What do you think art is? You know, this is an art, art is emotional. Art is, you know, powerful emotions represented in tranquility. And this is, you know, what you see on the internet all the time. Of course the id, of course our human id needs a place to live and call it Twitter for now. It used to be YouTube comments. So, but we are always taking the measure of something we've lost. Um, I get the word loss from lossy compression, you know, the engineering term, that how does, how MP3 takes that big, broad music signal and flattens it out. And something about listening to music on MP3, at least for me, made me feel a sense that I was grieving for something, I was missing something from my analog life. On the other hand, more than counterbalanced by the magic that I think we all experience on the internet. We wouldn't have a friendship if yeah. it weren't for social media and all kinds of other th things. And strange serendipity happens, not to mention artistic expression yeah. in the form of photography, film, design, poetry and music, which are the five chapters of the book. So the book is fantastic. The convergence and connection of people, concepts, life with the internet digitally is interesting, right? Yeah. So there's some loss with the MP3, great example, but have you found yeah, post book, new examples, I'm sure the internet culture yes. geeks like me are like, wow, this is so awesome. There's a cultural aspect of it. It's the digital experience, you know, we see it on dating sites, obviously you see you yeah. know, Snapchat, and, you know, dating sites like Tinder and other hookups apps and you know, real estate, everything being Uberized. Yeah. What's the new things that you're, that's coming out? You must have some inbound. Well, this may be controversial, but one thing I see happening is anti-digital culture, partly as an epiphenomenon, a, you know, a, a side effect of digitization, we have a whole world of people who really want to immerse themselves in things like live music, maker culture, things made by hand. Vinyl records. Vinyl records, which are selling more than ever in the days of the Rolling Stones' Gimme Shelter. Less, they sold less then than they do now. The Rolling Stones makes a billion dollars touring a year. Would we ever have thought that in the, in the, you know, at the genesis of the iPod when it seemed like 
you know, recorded music, represented music in that MP3 thing that floated through our, our phones was all we needed. No, we want to look in the faces of yeah. the Rolling Stones, get as close as we can to the way the music is actually made, and, you know, d almost defiantly, and this is how the culture works, this is how youth culture works, um, reject, create experiences that cannot be digitized. And this is really more of a counterculture movement it's a on the oversaturation of digital media. Yes, yes. You see the first people to scale down from, uh, you know, high-powered iPhones um, went, were youth going to flip phones. You know, it's like the greatest, like, greatest... Retro. Uh, greatest it's like, it's punk. Yeah, it's punk it's tech. It's punk tech, exactly. It's like, yeah, I'm going to use these instruments, but, ver like, if I break a string, who cares? And yeah. I'm going to use the simplest one. My possible. mom made me use my iPhone. My gonna, are we going exactly. to Are we going to have that? going to be like, oh, look at you with your basic iPhone over there, and I've got my just, like, hacked down, downscale, whatever. And you know what? I don't spend the weekends. I don't pick up my phone on the weekends. But, you know, there are yeah. interesting markets there and interesting, I mean, for instance, the, you know, the live phenomenon, I know that, you know, there's this new company by one of the founders of Netflix, Movie Pass, which um, for a $30 subscription, you see movies in the theater as much as you want, and the theaters are beautiful. And what, instead of Netflix and chill, you know, the, the, the contemporary, you know, standard date, it's dinner and a movie. You're out again, you're eating food, which can't be digitized, with in company, which can't be digitized, and then sitting in a theater, you know, a public yeah. experience, which is um, a pretty extraordinary way that you the culture and business pushes back on digitization. I remember I was at my undergraduate days in computer science in the 80s and before when it was nerdy, and, uh, and there was a sociology class that talked about computers and social change, and the big thing was, we're gonna lose social interactions because of email. Yeah. And if you think about what you're talking about, about here is that the face-to-face -face presence commitment of being with somebody right. now is the scarce resource yes you have an abundance of connections I mean take the fact what has happened is digital culture has jacked up the value of undigital culture so for instance you know I've, I've met on Facebook we talk on Facebook messenger yeah. we notice that we're you know like kindred spirits yeah. in a certain way and we like each other's posts and so yeah. forth then we have an, a more extensive talk in Messenger. When we meet in person for the first time, both of us are East Coast people, but we hugged hello. Yeah, because know. it's like, oh wow, I, like you in the flesh, you know, yeah. something exciting. So connection virtually. That's right. There's a, a synchronous connection, presence, Absolutely. but we're not really, we haven't met face to face yeah. and we felt it. There's this great uh, yeah. s uh, great little experiment going on. So a group of kids in Silicon Valley have decided they're too addicted to their phones and Facebook. Now, I am not recommending for your viewers and listeners that anybody do what these kids <laughs> It sounds good already. Go right. ahead. All right. So what they do is take an LSD breakfast. Now, I don't take drugs. I think you can do this without the LSD. But they put a little bit of a hallucinogen under their skin in the morning. And what they find is they lost interest in the boring interface of their phones because people on the bus suddenly looked so fascinating to them. The human face is an incredible yeah. interface. It can't be yeah. reproduced anywhere. Steve, you know, Johnny Ive can't make it. They can't make it at Google. And that, I think, is something we will see young markets doing, which is this renewed appreciation for nature. And, and analog. For human and, and for, for analog culture. That's right. The Navy is going to sextants and compasses, you may have seen, training their training sailors on those devices because of the fear that GPS might be hacked. So, you know, and the young kids probably don't even know what a compass is. Well, I bought myself a compass recently because I suddenly was like, you know, we talk a lot about digital technology, but what the heck? This thing can point toward the poles right in my hand? Yeah. You know, I was suddenly like, we are this floating ball with these poles with different magnetic charges, and I think it's time I appreciated that. Okay, so i got to ask the, um, the the feedback that you've gotten from the book. Um, again, we're here with uh, Virginia with Magic and Loss. Great, great book. Go buy it. It's fantastic. It'll open your mind up. It's a, it's a thought-provoking but really specific good use cases. I got to think that, you know, when you talk at Google, when you talk to some of the, the groups that you're talking to, certainly yeah. book clubs and other online, that there must be like, oh my God, you hit the cultural nerve. What have you heard from some of these um, folks from my age, 50, down to the 20-something-year-olds? Have you had any aha moments where you said, yeah. oh my God, I hit a nerve here? I did not want to, I mean, I didn't want to 
write one of those books that's like the one thing you need to know to get your startup to succeed or whatever. You know, I was yeah. at the airport and every single one of them is like, pop, the only thing you need to do to save this or whatever. And they, they do take a very short view. Now, if you're thinking about, yeah. you know, whether if you're thinking about your quarterly return, or your, you know, what you're going to do this quarter and how, yeah. when you're going to be profitable or user acquisition, those books are good manuals. But if you're going to buy a hardcover book and you're going to really yeah. invest in reading every page, not just the bolded part, not just yeah. the, you know, the two points that you have to know, I really wanted readers and I, what I had found on the internet, people like you, we have a, an interest in a long view, you know, yeah. and I mean a really long and view. And written in a prose that's not holistical or, you know, yeah. short sentences. Well, uh -huh. Like it's just a thought provoking book. Somebody can go, hey, you know, at the beach on the weekend, yeah. say, hey, wow, this is really cool. What if, well, you know, we went analog for a while or what if, what's best for my kids? Should I let my kids play multiplayer games more? Is that going to simulate yeah. life? That was my, so these are the kinds of questions that the digital parents are asking. Yeah, so, you know, like, let's take the parents' question, which is, uh, is you know, a surprisingly, to me, it's a surprisingly pressing question. I am a, a parent, but my kids' digital habits are not, you know, of obsessive interest to me. Sometimes I think the worry about our kids is a proxy for how we worry about ourselves. You know, it's funny because, the, you know, the model of the parent saying, my kid has attention deficit disorder, my kid has attention deficit disorder, the kid's over here, the yeah. parent's here, <laughs> you know, who has the attention deficit disorder? But in any case, I um, have realized that parents are talking about uh, c computers and the internet as though something kids have to have a very ambivalent relationship with and a very wary relationship with. So limit the time. And so it sounds a little bit like the abstinence yeah. movement around sexuality. That like, yeah. you know, you only dip in, it's very, you know, they're yeah. all these dangers. Taboo, blah, blah, right, blah. Right, right, right. Instead of joining sides with their kids and helping to create a durable, powerful, interesting online avatar, which is what kids want to do and it's also what we want to do. So like, in your Facebook profile, there are all kinds of strategic moves you can make as a creator of that profile. We know it as adults. Yeah. Like, do you, some people put up pictures of their kids, some people don't. Vacation pictures, some people promote the heck out of themselves, some yeah. people don't do so much of that. Um, do you put up a lot of photographs, do you whatever? Those are the decisions we started to make when we went on Facebook, and kids are making them too. Yeah, Small what armor to have on their gaming profile. That's right. What kind of, a, how they want to play, you know? In life, are you going to yeah. wear feathers? You know, these are important things. Um, but the, uh, you know, small questions like talking to your kids, and I don't mean a touchy-feely conversation, but literally, you're going to write in all lowercase, commit. You know, yeah. you write in all lowercase, you're cute, and you're this, and that yeah. means a certain thing, and you should get it, and you're going to write in all caps, and you're going to talk about white nationalist ideology. Well, that also has a set of consequences. <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned in terms of the virtual space? Obviously, augmented reality, virtual reality, these promise to be virtual spaces. What What is, what is, they always hope to replicate the real world. I mean, yeah. will there any, be any parallels of, of the kind of commitment in the moment gives you? One thing I say, because you know, the subtitle of the book is The Internet as Art, Magic and Lost, The Internet as Art. And the kind of art the internet is, is what I think of as realist art. It purports to be reality. You know, every technology, think of photography, yeah. film, says, or think of uh, even the introduction of a third dimension in painting, you know, in Renaissance painting perspective purports to represent reality better than it's been represented before. And if you're right in sync with the technology, you're typically fooled by it. I mean, this is a seductive representation of reality, yeah. you know? People watching us now believe they're seeing us, flesh and blood yeah. us, talk, you know? <laughs> they don't think they're seeing pixels that are designed in certain ways and circulate yeah. in certain ways. So trying to sort out the incredibly interesting, immersive, artful experience of being online that has some dangers and has some emotions to, to it from real life is a really important thing, you know, for us to learn first and then to model for our kids. So I had a horrible day on Twitter one day. In 2012, 2013, worst day ever on Twitter. It was a great day for me. I spent the day at the beach. My Twitter avatar took sniper fire for me all day. People yep. called her an idiot. You separated them out. I separated them out. And anyone who like likes role playing games knows that like I'm not a high priestess in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. You know, I'm a much smaller person than <laughs> that. And in in you know in the case of this Twitter battle, I'm a less embattled person than the one that yeah. takes. That's your armor. For me on Twitter, that's my armor. That's your armor. So let's talk about poetry and Twitter. You yeah. mentioned poetry, Twitter, 140 characters. 140 characters is a lot if, like a lot of internet users, you're used to pictographic language like Chinese. So 140 characters is a novel. Uh, well, not a novel, but it's a short story for, you know, a writer of short form, uh, short form 
Chinese aphorisms like Confucius. So one of the things I wanted to say is there's nothing about it being short that makes it low culture. You know, there's, I mean, it takes a second to, t to take in a sculpture or to take in a painting, and yet, like, the amount of craft that went into that might be much more. Good tweeting, and you're excellent at it, um, is not easy. You know, I know that many times I've been like, I tagged the wrong person and then I have to delete it like because the <laughs> name didn't come up or, yeah. you know, I get the hashtags wrong and then I'm like, oh, it would have been better this other way. Yeah. Or I don't have a smart enough introduction to it. It's like playing sports. Twitter is like, you know, firing at the tennis ball, baseline rallies with people. Totally. I mean, it's like, it's like this is a cultural thing. And this is the thing that I love about your book is you really bring in the metaphors around art and, and, and the yep. cultural aspect. Yeah. Have you had any, have you found that this one art piece Period that we yeah. represent right now that as, as a could be a comparison. Um, Interesting. I mean, you know, it's always tempting to compare everything to the Renaissance, but uh, you know, obviously in the Italian Renaissance there was so much technological innovation and so much um, and so much uh, so much artistic innovation. But um, you know, the other thing are the dawn of it might be bigger than that, which uh, it sounds grand grandiose, but we're talking about something that nearly six billion people use and have access to. So we're talking about something bigger than we've ever seen. Yeah is the dawn of a civilization. So like, we pay a lot of attention to the aqueducts in Rome, and, and uh, you know, later paid attention to the frescoes. I attend in this book to the frescoes, to the sculpture, to the music, to the art. So instead of talking about frescoes, as an art historian might, I talk about Instagram. Yeah. And, you, and this thing's all weaved together, because again, back to the global fabric. Amazing. If you look at the civilization as, you know, the, you know, to use the world as flat kind of metaphor, but that book kind of brings out that notion of, okay, if you just say a one global fabric, yes. you have poetry, you have pot uh, photography. I was talking with uh, John, he says, on an ad in, in London, he says, you know, cricket is a sport in England, a bug and a delicacy, depending on where in the world you are. I love that. Is that yeah. I wonder if that's the HSBC H ad. H They've H done BC. actually a beautiful, HSBC job has done a beautiful campaign, I should find out who did it, about perspective. That and that is also a wonderful way to think about the internet, because, you know, I know a lot of people who don't like Twitter, who don't like YouTube comments, I do like them because I am perpetually surprised at what people bring to their interpretation. The crowdsourcing insights in the comments can be yeah. revealing, you know? And, you know, you, you don't want to get your feelings hurt. Sometimes yeah. you don't want that much exposure to the microflora and fauna of ideas that could be frightening. But, you know, when you're up for it, it's a really nice test of your immune system, you know? All right, so what's next for you? Virginia Heffernan, Magic and Lost, great book. I think I will continue to write tech criticism, which is just this growing field. I, Sarah Watson had a wonderful piece today in the Columbia Journalism Review about how we really need to bring all our faculties to treat, treating uh, to tech criticism and, and treating tech with, um, with care and with mm -hmm. proper awe. Um, and the next book is on anti-digital culture. Um, I will continue to write yeah. journalism, and you'll see little previews of that book in the next yeah. work. You're super inspirational, and I think the culture needs this kind of rallying cry because, you know, there is art and science in all this beautiful beauty in the internet, and it's not about mutually exclusive analog world. You can look and take and come offline. So it's interesting Absolutely. case study of this this revolution. I think, and I think the counterculture. If you go back and yeah. I was talking to John Markoff about this when he wrote his his first book, uh, the Dormouse one, about yeah. the counterculture yeah. in Silicon Valley the is. Dormouse said, That's but a the, great book. What's yeah. a great book? And that countercultures usually create another wave of innovation. Yes. So the, the the question that comes out of this one is, there could, this could be a seminal moment in history. It, I mean, I think it absolutely is. You know, in some ways, every moment is a great moment if you know what to make of it. But I am just tired of people telling us that we're ruining our brains and that this is the end of innovation and that we're at some low period. I think we will look back and think of this as an incredibly fertile time for our imaginations if we yeah. don't lose hope, if yeah. we keep our creativity fired, um, and if we, you know, commit to this incredible period we're in. Virginia, thanks for spending the time here on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. We are live at Silicon Valley. This is the Cube with author Virginia Heffernan. Magic and Loss, great book. Get it if you don't have it. Hard copy still available. Get it. We'll be right back with more live coverage here. This is the Cube. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back with more after this short break.